everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here today. This is Paul Taubman with 9.connects. You are in the right place if you are here for our practical aspects of signal integrity. This is part four of the series. This particular webinar is going to focus specifically on serial communications. So with that, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for part four of the 9.connects webinar series on practical aspects of signal integrity. My name is Tom Cassidy, and I'm a senior engineer at 9.connects. I've been working in and around the field of electrical engineering for over 35 years. I've also dabbled in other areas, such as mechanical engineering, applications programming, FPGA design, and simulation of both mechanical and electrical systems. My intent for this webinar series is not to teach signal integrity per se, but to present a series of PCB layout design cases and show how we can apply signal integrity analysis to our designs. I started off this webinar series by examining some basic concepts of signal integrity analysis, looking at the practical effects of trace widths, routing angles, vias, return current paths, and so forth. In part two, I looked at more advanced routing cases, such as reference planes and strip line versus micro strip routing. In part three, I analyzed the implementation of a high-speed DDR3 memory design, with topics including termination, clock routing, crosstalk, and flyby versus T-branch routing. In this webinar, I will take a look at the signal integrity aspects of various serial communications paradigms. I'll start off with a brief history of serial communications to provide a baseline for some of the issues involved. I'll then look at the serial peripheral interface bus, a relatively slow serial communication scheme. Moving up the ladder, I'll then look at the USB bus, which I consider a medium to high speed bus. I'll then examine the PCI Express bus, which in the context of this webinar, I consider a high speed serial bus. I'll finish off with a quick look at how the high speed serial and parallel worlds are colliding. So just what do I mean when I say serial communications? Typically, the term serial is paired against the term parallel and refers to the physical method of transferring data from one part of the system to another relative to a unit of time. Serial, as the word suggests, means that the information is transferred sequentially over time, typically one piece of data at a time. Parallel, on the other hand, indicates that many pieces of information are transferred at the same time. This webinar will be focusing on different methods of transferring data using the serial paradigm, although as we will see later, many of the concepts and issues relating to high-speed serial communications are crossing over into the parallel domain. I'd like to start things off by defining some terms and setting the stage for the rest of the webinar. There are usually three main aspects to consider when transferring data between parts of a system. The physical size or amount of data being transferred, the logical encoding of that data, and the physical rate at which the data is being transferred. When discussing serial communications, the unit of data is usually referred to as a bit, but is often called a symbol when discussing high-speed serial channels. Encoding data is just a way of representing letters and numbers as groups of binary bits, like for instance, the familiar ASCII code. And the transfer rate refers to how much data per second is being transmitted. When talking about serial data, the term baud rate is often used. And since this term has been around for a very long time, it makes a nice segue into the next part of the webinar, in which I give a brief history of serial communications. If I were to ask you when you thought serial communication came into being, you might be tempted to say sometime around when computers and electronics were developed, say around the 1940s and 1950s. However, it might surprise you to know that the first form of serial communication predates the electronics era by more than a century. If we think of serial communication in its purest form, that of sending data sequentially over time, then the first practical serial communication system should be considered the visual semaphore system invented by Claude Chappé in France in the late 18th century. This system was based on a series of towers in line of sight with each other, using huge wooden arms that could be moved into different positions. Each position represented a unique symbol that encoded the message being sent. This system also nicely illustrates the difference between speed and latency, concepts I'll be talking more about later. 
While the data rate was pretty slow, considering that the first message ever sent reported on an event less than an hour after it occurred and from a distance of over 120 miles away, you can see how much quicker the entire message arrived than it would have been by sending a letter by horseback. Claude Semaphore was the first practical telecommunication system of the industrial age and stayed around until the 1850s when it was replaced with the electric telegraph. Surprisingly enough, the first commercially successful electric telegraph was really more parallel than serial in nature. The Cook and Wheatstone telegraph, invented in 1837, used six wires to control the position of five needles. Combined with an ingenious array of letters on a diamond-shaped grid, this telegraph did not need an encoding scheme and thus required very little training to use. However, the cost of installing six wires over long distances proved prohibitive and nicely illustrates one of the main reasons why serial communications can be preferred over parallel methods, that of reducing the cost and complexity of the physical transmission system. Several unsuccessful attempts were made to address this problem until in the United States, Samuel Morris developed the first practical single wire telegraph system. Using a single wire combined with an earth ground, the materials and installation costs were thus greatly reduced. Once telegraph wires started crisscrossing the land to connect cities and even countries, it naturally became desirable to run cables across the oceans to connect continents. And since these undersea cables were so much longer than those used on land, they were the first to experience electrical problems of a kind that we now associate with transmission lines. In fact, it was Lord Kelvin's work on the mathematical description of these long transmission cables that laid the foundation for the signal integrity analysis methods we use today. While the switch to single wire transmissions greatly improved things, nothing comes for free and the use of fewer wires meant that a more complex encoding system was required. The most successful scheme was also invented by Samuel Morris and is of course the Morse code. Early schemes required counting the number of clicks for each symbol, while Morse code incorporates both the click and the time between the clicks to encode the symbol. This greatly improved the efficiency of the system and the Morse code has been around for a long time. Unfortunately, the use of Morse code required highly trained and skilled operators, which increased the overall expense. Making the system more user-friendly would reduce the cost and thus improve the overall system. In 1874, the French engineer Emile Baudet patented the printing telegraph using a five-bit pattern to encode the letters. While still requiring skilled operators, it eventually led to the development of the teletype machine which essentially just connected two typewriters together. This meant that anyone could type on one end of the system and have the plain text message appear on the other end. A modified form of the bought out code was used to encode letters in these teletype machines. And in fact, it was Emil Baudot's code that led to the phrase baud rate that is still in use today. Nowadays, the term baud rate refers to the bits per second of serial data transmission. Confusingly, this is not a direct correlation to the actual number of data bits being sent, since the data stream typically includes bits for flow control, which use up some of the data bandwidth. Moving on to more recent history, the advent of the mainframe computer led to the development of the remote teletype terminal, and eventually to CRT-based display terminals, also known as dumb terminals. Thus began the era of the ubiquitous RS-232 serial interface, which was widely used to connect these terminals to the mainframe computers. The RS-232 remained as the serial port of choice when personal computers came into being, used to connect various peripheral devices such as modems and printers. It is a testament to its robustness that it is still in use today, although it is rapidly being replaced by USB. Okay, enough history. Let's start talking about the modern day and take a look at the Serial Peripheral Interface Bus, or the SPI Bus. Developed in the mid-1980s by Motorola, it's become the de facto standard for short distance communications between ICs on a PCB. And the fact that it is called a standard is interesting because in fact, there is no actual formal definition for the SPI bus. This means that there are a lot of variations in the wild relating to data word size, clock polarity, and even the number of signals being used. However, for the purposes of this webinar, I'm only going to be looking at the most common implementation. The SPI bus is what is known as a synchronous serial communications interface, which means that the data transfers are synchronized by a separate clock signal. 
The most common configuration of a spy bus is shown here. As you can see, there are four signals associated with the bus. The clock signal, S-clock, the select signal, SS, and the two data paths, MOSI and MISO. The two data paths indicate that the spy bus is full duplex, meaning that the data goes into and out of the master at the same time. This is one of the benefits of the spy bus paradigm. The spy bus essentially works as a ring topology of shift registers, with data being transferred on the clock edge. As you see here, the data is leaving the master on the MOSI bus and is coming back in on the MISO signal. While it is possible to daisy chain these signals, the most common topology is actually to have all of the signals in parallel and use the chip select signals to pick which slave is being accessed. Since there is no formal standard for the bus, there is no maximum clock rate to find. So you can basically run it as fast as you want, limited only by the devices themselves and any signal integrity limitations based on the routing. Most speeds are in the 10 megahertz range, but you can easily run up to 50 megahertz if your devices and routing support it. As I stated earlier, there are typically three common signals that need to be routed between the master and all slave devices, shown here highlighted in green. There are additional individual select signals for each slave, shown here in blue. The need for routing four or more traces makes routing SPI more difficult than some of the other serial bus types available. So it is desirable to use the easiest possible routing techniques to minimize the effort involved in routing these multiple signals. If you search for how to route SPI buses, you'll come across a wide range of selections, ranging from just do whatever to treat them like sensitive high-speed signals. But how do you really know what you need to do when routing your own SPI design? Since the SPI bus is a synchronous serial bus, it is the relationship between the clock edge and the data signals that is the most critical parameter for proper operation. So really, the only routing requirement is that the end results give you the proper timing relationship at the desired clock speed. Of course, you might still have to worry about EMI and other possible signal integrity issues, but the timing is really the most basic requirement in selecting your routing paradigm. As we know from my previous webinars, the signal integrity is affected by the edge transitions or slew rate of the signals, not the actual clock speed. But since the clock speeds for SPI buses are typically in the 10 to 50 megahertz range, and you won't need to have fast edge transitions to meet timing, so you can use slower slew rates and still meet your timing requirements. But be warned that some devices may not give you a choice and will still have high slew rates, even at relatively slow clock speeds. So don't just assume running at 10 megahertz means that you will not have signal integrity issues. Let's look at a real world implementation of a SPI bus. The design I'm showing here is derived from a design using a Texas Instruments TMS 570 MCU as the SPI master device. It has four slave devices on the SPI bus, two flash devices and two thermocouple interface chips. Thus, as we see in the schematics, there are three SPI bus signals and four chip selects. For this demonstration, I will just be looking at the SPI bus signals and ignoring the chip selects. Here's the layout that I extracted from the final design, of which for clarity, I've removed all of the other devices and traces not associated with the SPI bus. As you see, the routing isn't the cleanest. All of the signals cross multiple routing layers, and thus there are plenty of vias. I did manage to keep the stubs relatively short though. So based on this layout, the question is, how well will it work in the real world? Is my unclean routing okay from a signal integrity perspective, or am I gonna to have to do a respin to get it to work? We can glean some indications about the possible signal integrity issues from the pin layout of the TMS 570. As we see here, the ground pins circled in green are nowhere near the spy signals circled in pink. This indicates that the designers of the chip were not all that concerned about the return current paths for these signals. Another indication about the lack of SI concerns is the fact that these pins are shared with other functions, including general purpose IO. Thus, it is unlikely that these pins have strict driving and receiving requirements typical of high-speed signals. And in fact, if we look at the TMS 570 datasheet, we find that the maximum clock rate for the SPI module is only 25 megahertz, and the fastest possible rise time is listed as four nanoseconds. 
Using Eric Bogatin's signal bandwidth formula in which we can estimate the required bandwidth of a signal based on its rise time, we can determine that the bandwidth for the TMS570 SPI signals is only 0.0875 gigahertz or about 87.5 megahertz. This means that the signal's frequency components above about 90 megahertz can be ignored. Compare this number to the 1.4 gigahertz bandwidth for DDR3 and we see that we're operating in some pretty easy territory. Before I dig into the results, I'd like to give a quick overview of the simulation process I used, borrowing some slides from my first webinar. I first created a design case layout using Altium Designer and saved the results as an ODB++ file. I then import this into the Cadence Security Power SI program. This lets me do a full wave 3D EM simulation of the PCB and generates the S parameters of the traces that we are interested in. Using this S parameter file, as well as the IBIS models of my components, I am able to generate time and frequency domain simulations using Cadence System SI. If you are interested in more details about this process, I recommend you review my previous webinars, and in particular, the first in the series. You can access these videos on the 9.connects website or ask us to send you the links. So let's look at the results of simulating my SPI design. Here we see the S parameter results for the three SPI bus signals. I went ahead and simulated up to two gigahertz, but recall that we only really care about frequencies lower than about 90 megahertz. And as we see at that frequency range, the signals are really good. It's not until we get up into the gigahertz range that we start to see some resonant conditions affecting the frequency responses. Moving over into the time domain, Here's the setup for the system SI simulation. I used a very simple model, which is three main components, the TMS570 MCU, the SPI flash memory, and the PCB model itself. And here are the simulation results as a timing diagram. The S clock signal is in red, and the data signals are in blue and green. I simulated at a clock speed of 40 megahertz, and as you see, we have plenty of timing margin around the clock edges. Adding in the eye diagram really emphasizes this margin. Just out of curiosity, and since it is so easy to change the clock rate, I went ahead and simulated for 100 megahertz. This is about double what the fastest spy devices are usually able to handle. As you see, we still have pretty good timing margins. This simulation was for the chip closer to the controller. If I change to the chip farthest away, we get these results. Not much different other than a little more ringing. To me, this indicates that any SI issues we might have are locked in by the overall routing, not by the relative position of the chips in the bus chain. Suppose we have slave devices that are actually much farther away from the controller. To check this out, I changed the routing to add in a lot more trace length between the flash chip and the MCU. Here is the resulting layout. These traces are over eight inches long, and I added in some layer changes just to make it more realistic. After simulating the new PCB, I get these S parameters. They look a little bit messier in the higher frequencies, but we are still pretty good in our target range of less than 90 megahertz. However, when we look at the time domain analysis, we see some pretty serious overshoot on all signals. While this is not as critical on the data signals, it could cause false clocking on the S clock line. So here we have a nice example of why, even at slow clock speeds and slow rise times, you can still end up with signal integrity issues. In this case, we require some termination to get rid of the overshoot. A series resistor near the MCU should do the trick. The value of the resistor should be chosen to match the impedance of the traces as close as possible, but it does not need to be exact. Here I choose a 40.2 ohm resistor, while the measured impedance of the trace is actually about 46 ohms. After simulation, we can see that the clock signal looks a lot better. I would feel pretty good sending this design for fabrication. This design showcases how useful it is to perform simulation during the course of both the design and layout. If desired, I could fine tune the resistor values completely in software without needing to build a prototype and mess around in the lab. In fact, I might even discover that only some signals need termination, and thus I could save on PC board space and component costs. In today's world, the SPI bus is considered a relatively low speed serial bus. Here are some bits per second numbers from various other serial communications channels, including some historical values for comparison.
However, as we've seen, just because SPI is considered relatively slow does not mean it is immune to SI issues and that you can just route and forget. As always, when in doubt, simulate. Our examination of the SPI bus also lays a nice foundation for the exploration of higher speed serial buses. To this end, let's take a look at USB, which in the context of this webinar, we'll consider a medium to high speed bus. The USB, or universal serial bus, was intended as a means to standardize the connection scheme between computers and peripherals. With the widespread use of personal computers and the associated explosion of the number and types of peripherals available, there was a corresponding increase in the different types of interconnects used. This led to excess complexity and confusion with both customers and manufacturers. To help deal with this issue, a group of technology industry leaders got together and developed the USB protocol. While the majority of peripherals used the venerable RS-232 standard, there were still a lot of variations on this theme, as well as the use of parallel ports and even custom interfaces. USB was intended to address many of the physical shortcomings of these interfaces by providing a standardized set of connectors designed to meet the needs of today's smaller devices. In addition to the physical dimensions, the USB standard also improved on the baseline transmission speeds and provided for such additional functionality such as hot swapping, better peripheral powering, and so on. USB 1.0 was released in 1996 with relatively fast data rates from 1.5 to 12 megabits per second, but with only the larger USB-A and USB-B connectors available. Over time, various releases improved on the transfer rates and added additional features and connector types. USB 3 is the current reigning standard, released in 2008. It ups the data transfer rate to a nominal 5 gigabits per second, with a raw data throughput of 500 megabytes per second. The latest USB 3 version, USB 3.2, was released in 2017 and introduced the USB-C connector with data rates up to 20 gigabits per second. I'm going to focus on USB 3 for this webinar, but there is another version after that. While USB 4.0 was released in August 2019 and bumps the data rate up to 40 gigabits per second, it is yet to reach widespread use. Okay, let's take a look at the physical implementation of a USB communications channel. In contrast to the SPI bus, the USB is what is considered an asynchronous serial bus. This means that instead of having separate clock and data lines like the SPI bus, the USB bus combines the clock and data functionality in a single wire. While this method helps reduce the amount of wiring and makes routing easier, it does not come for free. The reduction in wiring complexity comes with a corresponding increase in the complexity of the encoding scheme, which I will discuss shortly. Physically, the data signals of a USB channel are transmitted using differential signaling. And since the USB is mainly intended to be used to connect devices with cables, this defines the use of twisted pair wires with 90 ohm differential impedance. And of course, since there will also be traces on the PCB, we will want to match the same impedance, so we will use 90 ohm differential pair routing there as well. I've covered the signal integrity aspects of differential pair traces in a previous webinar, so in the interest of time, I will not repeat that here. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, I suggest you watch part three of my webinar series. Okay, so now that we have the physical medium defined, we need to figure out how to send data over it. Since most digital circuitry uses parallel data as its native format, in order to transmit serially, we must be able to convert this parallel data to serial data at the transmitter and then convert it back to parallel data at the receiver. This process occurs in a functional block known as a SERDES. This stands for serializer deserializer and is a core component of any asynchronous serial communication scheme. At its most basic, this conversion between parallel and serial data is relatively straightforward, essentially just using the same method as a SPI bus, that of a serial shift register. However, in addition to converting parallel data to serial data, there is another basic requirement when using an asynchronous transmission paradigm. We still need a way to both embed and then recover this clock signal as well. In order to extract a clock from the data stream, we need to use the data transitions as a reference and essentially match a clock to these transitions. There are a variety of methods for doing this matching, such as PLL or phase lock loop, delay lock loop, and oversampling. 
But obviously for this method to work, we will need to have a sufficient number of transitions occurring sufficiently often in the data stream to give us something to lock onto. And unfortunately, we cannot rely on the actual data we are sending, since as I'm sure you can imagine, it is very possible that we might get long sequences of zeros or ones in normal streams of data. So we use a method of mapping the raw data into a new sequence that ensures that we will have the transitions we need regardless of the actual raw data values. This is known as encoding, and as you might expect, there are a variety of encoding schemes in use today. USB uses an encoding scheme known as 8B 10B. As the name suggests, 8B 10B maps the entire range of 256 discrete numbers of an 8-bit byte into 1,024 discrete numbers of a 10-bit word. Since we have essentially four times as many data patterns available to us than we actually need, we can just pick and choose among these values to ensure that we have enough transitions to both embed and recover our clock signal. The algorithm used in the 8B 10B encoding scheme ensures that we never have more than five zeros or five ones in a row. There is an obvious downside to using this type of encoding, however. Since we are now sending 10 bits for every eight bits of real data, our effective bandwidth has been reduced by 20%. There are other encoding schemes that help reduce this overhead, but once again, at the cost of a more complex implementation. In addition to serializing our data and embedding the clock, the SIRDES and encoding scheme performs one additional important function. As we see in this diagram, if on average we send more zeros than ones over a transmission line, the average DC value of the signal will skew negative, as shown by the blue line. This DC bias will affect the electronics at the receiver, making it harder to detect the data transitions and recover the clock. So in addition to ensuring that we have a sufficient number of transitions, we also need to ensure that we have the same average number of zeros and ones being transmitted. This is known as DC balancing, and its effect is shown here with the black line. Fortunately, the same method we use to encode for transitions can also be used to encode for DC balancing. We just need to pick a value that helps restore the DC balance based on the data that has already been sent. In essence, the transmitter keeps track of the running average of ones and zeros and picks new symbols that will help restore the overall average. Okay, I think that's enough theory for now. Let's look at some implementation. In order to demonstrate the operation of a USB channel, I'm gonna change up my method a bit and just use the functional simulations of system SI rather than creating different PCB models. I think that since USB is more of a cable-based interconnect scheme, Playing with PCB layouts isn't going to be all that informative at this stage. I'll get back to PCB simulations in the next section on the PCIe backplane bus. System SI is a very powerful tool that lets you analyze every aspect of a serial link. In addition to the types of low-level analysis I've shown so far, it also provides analysis tools for standards compliance verifications for a wide range of different high-speed serial schemes. Here is an example of a system SI project that would be used to check for USB 3.1 Gen 2 compliance. As you see, there are blocks for pretty much every component and cable in the serial chain, including physical models of IC packages, cables, and connectors. But at this point in the webinar, I'm really more interested in just providing an introduction to some of the concepts used when analyzing high-speed serial communications links. To this end, I will greatly simplify things and will start with a model based on a simple single channel link. But I will show some results of the USB 3 compliance testing later, once we understand some of the concept used to measure high speed links. Here we see the serial transmitter and receiver modules. These can be SPICE models, but are more often IBIS models since they usually represent more complicated devices. And these modules represent the physical packages of the integrated circuits, essentially modeling the connections between the IC die and the PCB. Not something I would typically simulate, but System SI provided default values in the template I used to create this project, so I just went with it. And finally, we have the PCB itself. There are a variety of ways this can be represented, depending on what you wish to accomplish in the simulation. The default template uses a SPICE model with direct connections and typical transmission line values. Once we have the real PCB, we can substitute in the S parameter file generated using 3D full wave EM simulation from PowerSI. And lastly, there are these oval shapes labeled AMI. 
I will pass over these for now and wait to talk about them later in the PCIe section of the webinar. Okay, here's the default result screen we get after running the simulation. As you see, there are a variety of report types representing different analysis methods. The upper half of the display shows the graphical model and also gives a text-based report on the results. This provides numerical information for both the model input parameters as well as the results themselves. The lower half shows two different representations of eye diagrams, which are perhaps the most useful type of diagram when analyzing serial communications channels. When running serial bus simulations, you typically run hundreds or even thousands of random bit patterns, and obviously you wouldn't want to shift through all of these waveforms individually. The eye diagram essentially overlaps all of these waveforms, giving a statistical view of the voltage levels and timing margins the circuit would see over the course of long-term operation. Using some slides from a previous webinar, we can see the waveform at the top and the associated eye diagram at the bottom. This illustrates how the individual cycles of a repeating waveform are overlapped to create the eye diagram. And since the eye diagram is so valuable, there are several flavors of it in use as well. Here's what we call an eye contour. This is essentially the envelope of the signals from a pure eye diagram. The eye contour makes it easier to both visualize and measure the different parameters we can derive from an eye diagram. Some of the more important measurements include vertical eye opening, eye height, and jitter. Another way to look at the eye diagram is by using a 3D plot of what is known as eye density. Here is an example with the z-axis representing the density of the signal. This is a representation of how many signals overlap at a given point and indicates the eye crossing percentage, which is essentially a measurement of the pulse symmetry. One last graph I like to show is something called a bathtub graph. The name comes from the fact that, as you see here, the graph has two sides that kind of look like the cross section of a bathtub. Bathtub graphs help us measure something known as bit error rate, or BER. A bit error occurs when the transition from one bit overlaps the setup or hold time of the adjacent bit, in effect causing the wrong value to be detected. The narrower the width of the bathtub, the more bit errors you could expect. And FYI, this bathtub graph looks pretty good. To conclude the USB section of this webinar, I'll show the results of compliance simulations on a default USB 3.1 template provided by SystemSI. Here's the model being used. And here are the results. As you see in the eye contour, the eye is really closed, indicating this default setup would not pass compliance. While slightly harder to read, the 3D density diagram also shows very little symmetry, indicating a lot of jitter noise. And in fact, the compliance results summary does indicate that this design would not pass the eye height test. As it turned out, I ended up using the USB section to show more about the concepts and topics of high-speed serial communications rather than the specifics of the USB 3 protocol and routing requirements. This is mainly because, as I said earlier, the routing requirements for USB are really just doing proper differential pair routing and are not necessarily unique or specific to the USB protocol. However, I will show more effects of routing in the next section on PCIe, since the PCI is intended as a backplane paradigm and thus is more dependent on the routing. So far, I've examined two serial communications paradigms, the SPI bus and the USB bus. In the context of this webinar, I consider SPI to be the low speed bus, and I've labeled USB a medium to high speed bus. Of course, these terms are relative, but will serve my purposes here. I'll now take a look at the PCI Express bus. In the same context, I consider PCI Express to be a high-speed bus compared to SPI and USB, and we'll see why shortly. So just what is PCI Express? PCI stands for Peripheral Component Interconnect, and the Express represents the serial version of this bus. In the most generic terms, PCI Express can be considered an interface standard for connecting high-speed devices. But for the most part, PCI Express is used as a backplane standard to support expansion devices and personal computers, connecting daughter cards to the processor within the confines of a single computer system. However, there is nothing in the definition that constrains it to being a backplane only, and in fact, advanced designs can use the PCI Express as an interconnect between devices on the same PCB. To better understand what PCI Express is, 
what its benefits are, and indeed why PCI Express even exists in the first place, let's take a look at the evolution of the backplane bus. PCI Express is the latest in a rather long line of backplane expansion bus designs. It is essentially a serial replacement for the older buses that were based on parallel architectures, much like the single wire telegraph superseded its predecessors. Here are some pictures of different kinds of parallel backplanes, but since PCI Express is mostly associated with personal computers, I'll focus on the various incarnations of the PCB backplanes. Although there were plenty of other personal computer options available before its release in 1981, it was the IBM Model 5150 computer, commonly known as the IBM PC, that set the standard for PCs. And my apologies to the Apple aficionados out there, but I just can't cover everything in this webinar. This setting of the market standard was largely due to the fact that IBM, going against type, decided to release the system with an open architecture, and in fact even published the technical specifications for the computer. This gave third-party suppliers free reign to provide a large variety of peripheral devices and help cement the IBM PC as the industry standard. The original IBM PC came with an 8-bit parallel backplane expansion bus, since the processor was an 8-bit Intel 8088. Running at a blazing 4.77 megahertz, this bus was still powerful enough to support the available peripherals of the time, such as modems and low-resolution graphics cards. Over time, as the core processor technology improved, IBM released newer and better systems. In 1984, IBM released the System Unit 5170, known as the IBM AT, with AT standing for Advanced Technology. This system was based on the Intel 8286, a true 16-bit processor. This meant that the expansion bus could also be 16 bits, and thus the ISA bus was born. ISA, which stands for Industry Standard Architecture, is a term very much a product of its times. At the time of the release of the PCAT, IBM was losing its hold on the PC market with the rise of IBM compatible machines available from a growing number of companies, with Compaq Computer Corporation leading the way. In order to break IBM's stranglehold on the market and to avoid copyright issues, Compaq coined the term Industry Standard Architecture to help make things easier for everyone, except IBM, of course. While the ISA bus was a true 16-bit parallel bus, it really just essentially added more data signals to the existing 8-bit bus, and thus was not a huge leap in innovation. But for the most part, this was still sufficiently powerful to handle the peripheral devices of the times. It wasn't until the 32-bit Intel 8386 processor came out that the expansion bus started to be a real drag on the system. The first 8386 system still maintained the 16-bit expansion bus, both for compatibility and due to the fact that IBM still hadn't come out with a 32-bit standard yet. It is now that we start to see the forces coming into play that would eventually lead to the PCI Express bus. Going from 8 to 16 bits was not that big of a deal, but going from 16 to a 32-bit parallel bus meant adding a lot more signals, which also meant a corresponding increase in the connector size, board space, and routing complexity. In addition, bus speeds were increasing to the point that the relative timing between traces was also becoming important. IBM tried to address this problem by coming up with the microchannel architecture, or MCA, which while being a nicely designed 32-bit bus that provided many improvements on ISA, it was not backwards compatible and in fact was considered a proprietary design. At the same time, Compaq and other non-IBM companies came up with the ESA bus, which stands for Extended Industry Standard Architecture. As the name suggests, it was fully backwards compatible with the ISA bus, both electrically and physically. This meant that all existing peripherals would still work with it, and new 32-bit devices could be developed as needed. And as a personal interest story, I started working at Compaq after grad school and I was actually on the engineering team that defined the ESA standard. In fact, some of my work made it directly into the published standards. Here I am with the original ESA Tech Ref manual. Unfortunately, neither the microchannel architecture nor the ESA bus had much longevity. The incompatibility of the MCA meant the industry would have to throw away all existing boards, which as you can imagine, didn't go over very well. 
And as it turns out, the industry standard compatibility of the ESA bus was actually an Achilles heel, anchoring the bus to an increasingly outdated architecture and preventing it from improving with the times. Enter the PCI bus, standing for Peripheral Component Interconnect. The PCI began development at Intel starting around 1990. It was first used on server platforms, where the performance increase was more important than maintaining backwards compatibility and cost was not as much of a factor. General consumer market penetration of the PCI bus started happening in 1994, and by 1996, the PCI became the de facto standard for all new PCs. The initial PCI standard was a 32-bit parallel architecture. The connector, while of roughly the same size as the ISA bus, used narrower pins and thus could cram more signals in the same area. While this meant the overall size of the system and its peripheral cards could remain the same, it made routing even more difficult. The advent of widely available 64-bit processors, as well as high-speed peripheral devices demanding more and more bandwidth, put the final nail in the coffin for expansion buses relying on a parallel architecture, and thus was born the PCI Express standard. PCI Express was created to deal with the problem of needing high-speed interconnections between processes and peripherals without the associated issues of high-density routing and timing issues that arise with ever larger parallel bus implementations. PCI Express solves this problem by using one or more high-speed serial buses instead of a parallel bus. Each serial bus is known as a lane, and depending on their needs, peripheral devices can use up to 32 lanes, although most devices typically use from 1 to 16. In addition to reducing the number of signals needed, another benefit is that PCI Express is a point-to-point -point architecture. Previous schemes had to share the data bus between devices, using ever more complex schemes to arbitrate and share this common resource. PCI Express, on the other hand, provides dedicated serial lines for each device, both greatly simplifying and speeding up the bus. And not only does each device have its own unique connection, but they are also full duplex, meaning the data can flow both to and from the device at the same time. This was not possible with a shared parallel bus. Physically, a single PCI Express lane requires just two differential pairs, one for the transmit side and one for the receive side. Thus, at its most basic, a PCI Express lane can be implemented using only four traces. Of course, in addition to the core communications channels, there are additional pins available on a PCI Express connector. These include power and ground connections, as well as low-speed SM bus and JTAG buses. These are used to negotiate during initialization and for out-of-band communication should they be needed. Like the USB bus, the earlier versions of PCI Express also used 8B slash 10B encoding. However, starting with version 3.0, the 128B, 130B encoding scheme was used. This reduces the bandwidth overhead from 20% to only about 1.5%, which is a significant savings. With regards to the actual PCB routing, as it turns out, there isn't really anything interesting to show by comparing different layouts. Since the physical layer is really just implemented on differential pairs, there is nothing unique to PCI Express when it comes to routing. Just do the layout as best you can using normal differential pair routing techniques and simulate when you're finished to ensure that you meet compliance. So for the PCI Express, I'm not going to give any examples of different PCB layouts, but just focus on some higher level concepts as demonstrated in the system SI simulation models. And here is a model of a simple PCI Express implementation. As you see, it has very similar components to that of the USB model we used earlier. It has a transmitter and a receiver, IC package models, and the PCB interconnect. And it also has those curious ovals labeled AMI, which I glossed over earlier, but will now examine. AMI stands for Algorithmic Modeling Interface and is more properly called IBIS-AMI since it is an extension of the IBIS standard added in 2007. As used here, AMI essentially lets you model adaptive equalization algorithms during simulation to help you figure out the parameters needed to ensure proper system operation. So what is an adaptive equalization algorithm and why do we need it? To put it perhaps too simply, adaptive equalization is a digital signal processing technique that we can use to clean up noisy serial communication channels 
essentially removing edge overlap and noise issues and opening up the eye. The algorithm used for PCI Express is called Decision Feedback Equalization and involves several feedback taps that essentially use the past history of the signal to figure out what is going on in the present. These taps have different settings depending on the system parameters and the IBIS AMI part of the system SI model lets us figure out what these settings should be. But instead of delving into the grungy details, let's just take a look at what happens when we simulate a system that has the AMI models both disabled and enabled. Here are the results of the simulation with AMI disabled. As we see, while not totally closed, the eye is still looking pretty bad. And I should point out that we used an ideal PCB model in this simulation, so it is not going to get any better in the real world. And here is the simulation with the AMI models enabled. The eye has definitely opened up more, and this is just with default values. System SI has the ability to help us figure out even better parameters and even the number of taps needed, so we can very likely get even better results with a little more work. I'd like to end the webinar with a discussion of how the analysis tools and techniques from the world of high-speed serial communications are bleeding over into the areas traditionally thought of as the parallel domain. To illustrate this point, I'll take a brief look at the specs of the upcoming DDR5 memory devices. While DDR5 utilizes parallel buses for the address and data lines, the bus speeds are getting to the point where the individual parallel bus signals start to have the same issues as serial communication signals. Here are some images representing a typical data cycle of a DDR5 device. On the left are the timing relationships you would typically worry about the setup and hold times of all of the data pins relative to the strobe transitions. And on the right is the use of an eye diagram to help define these values even better. It should be noted, however, that these eye diagrams represent the overlapping of many different signals at the same time, rather than a single signal overlapped over a long time, as is done for serial communications channels. Here is a system SI project of a DDR3 design one that I used for my previous webinar. I'm using it here to generate an example waveform of just a single data bus signal. And here are the results of that simulation with the time domain waveform on the top and the same data represented as an eye diagram on the bottom. As you can see, the eye diagram looks very much like that of a standard serial communication signal, even though it is actually a part of a parallel bus architecture. Going back to DDR5, we find that the standard clock speed is 3.2 gigahertz, and there is even talk of being able to go up to 8.4 gigahertz someday. So at these speeds, even the parallel bus signals start to exhibit the same problems as high-speed serial links, overshoot and noise closing the height of the eye, and jitter causing edge overlap and narrowing the bathtub. Here is an actual measurement from Micron Technologies showing the closed eye at the pin of a device running at 4,400 megatransfers per second. In order to overcome these issues, the DDR5 standard incorporates the same digital signal processing method that is used in high-speed serial links, that of decision feedback equalization. And here are side-by-side -side measurements showing the effects with DFE enabled. As you can see, the eye has opened up quite a bit, and this will most likely pass certification. So in conclusion, here again is a list of the topics I covered in today's webinar. Starting with a look at the first implementations of serial communications back in the 1700s, I touched on a few modern serial paradigms showing various design and simulation aspects associated with serial design. I wrap things up with the warning that even if you're not designing high-speed serial channels specifically, you still need to understand how they work since the parallel world is rapidly looking more and more serial. Thank you for attending my webinar, and I hope you found it entertaining and instructive. Back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to have, uh, we're gonna start one of two polling questions here, and so we'll get that started here. So you can take a moment to take a look at that and, uh, and uh, click on the boxes that would be applicable to you, or just kind of interesting. We would like to know basically if you are uh, using any of the buses that Tom has referred to in the webinar here today. Uh, so a large portion of you are definitely using the um, SBI and also the USB as well. And actually even more than we thought, I think with the PCIe bus, 
uh, there as well. So yeah, thank you very much for that. And then lastly, one other question we have for you, uh, just what you felt of the webinar. Thank you guys for giving us that feedback. We do appreciate it here. So here for a reason that the signal integrity issues are the last thing that one wants uh, on such a critical path, especially when we're dealing with something that's serial here. And one of the things that came up, it was an interesting question that was asked to me by a former colleague about getting into simulation. And what I want to do is kind of answer that here in a more public setting. So what does it really take if you want to get into simulation yourself? Well, first and foremost, the tools. So we are we are lucky to have the uh, the Sigrity tool, but there are other tools out there as well. And you really do want to have one of these higher end tools, especially those that do have the 3D solving engines that are associated with them. You can do the old algebraic form, the formula ones, but they're very limited in what they can do. And why do they charge top dollar for these? Well, it's really plain and simple to find those people who can really code and understand RF signaling are really rare uh, to find. So they, they can charge a premium for these particular type of tools. Secondly, even if you bought one of these tools, there is a learning curve. And I'm pretty sure that Tom can attest to the fact that when he first got the Sigrity tool, uh, he was pulling out his hair for about three months uh, trying to get his head wrapped around it. And there's a lot to do because it's just not about pushing the button. He did mention during the webinar that you've got to bring in the ODB++ files. What he didn't tell you uh, in that quick commentary was that, that there's quite a bit of massaging that has to do with those ODD, ODB++ files in addition to all of the IBIS files that he's got to add so that the, the, com the components are properly represented. And of course, there's the equipment itself. Uh, the, this type of software that you buy is not something that you could run it on a laptop or onto a PC, but it really needs to have a lot more horsepower. It needs to have a better motherboard. It has to have a higher processor. It certainly needs to have the memory in order to do this. And I know that Tom's invested quite a bit in his computer setup in order to be able to do these type of simulations. And two other thoughts for you on this, the downtime, because you can see that you can easily spend $100,000 in training equipment and on software rather easily. But how much downtime do you expect to have if you are going to learn this here? Because even if it was 25% of the time that you're going to use this, well, that's 75% of the time in a given year that you won't. And everybody knows it's use it or lose it. So if you don't do it for a while and you get back to it, you're going to be rusty uh, with it. So if you're going to do this, it's one of those things that you want to be able to do all the time. And then lastly, are you thinking about this as a crutch or a verification? So what I mean by a crutch is that you really don't feel like you can do the work without it versus verification where it's like, you know you could do the work, but this is simply just to verify the work that you're doing uh, in, in there as well. And hopefully with the understanding that you have with high-speed design and the, the knowledge and the rules of thumbs that you can use, this becomes a verification and not a crutch. So here at Nine Dot Connects, we've kind of gone 180 uh, when it comes to simulation. What do I mean by that? Well, in the distant past, we would say, don't bother with simulation. It's just cheaper and more effective for you to just simply make the board, figure out what you did wrong, maybe take a class or two on high-speed design, and through the rules of thumb, you'll do just fine without all this simulation. Because you can see there's obviously a huge investment. And as a matter of fact, I would still recommend this to a smaller business that says, you know what, I really can't afford what you just explained over here. So if you do have those rules of thumb and it's just cheaper to do a respin than just do a respin. Now, more recently, we've started introducing our own simulation services as well. And so when we go to a client or actually a client comes to us as we like to lay out a board, well, we had always tried to say, well, do you want simulation with that? And some of our customers said yes, and some of them said no. Well, I'm here to announce that really starting from this point on, that if you do engage us here at Nine Dot Connects, and you're doing some type of high-speed board, we've gotten so acclimated to the simulation tool that it really doesn't take us that much more to use the simulation tool as a part of the layout procedure. So if you ask us to do a board, that simulation is going to be a part of it as just part of our verification and a value add that we would add to our services just to differentiate us from all the others who do this type of work. So with that being said, uh, if you'd like more information about what we do here at Nine Dot Connects, in particular for simulation, do check us out on our website at nine.connects.com. And if you go under engineering services, you'll see our write-up. And we've recently refreshed this 
and it's about the simulation overview. With that, I want to thank you very much for joining us here today, and you have a great day.